He's had Courtney Love pose as Mary Magdalene and pictured the late Michael Jackson as a martyr. Visions that have helped David LaChapelle catapult from struggling artist to world-famous photographer. He's also injected his signature style into music videos, directing them for artists such as Jennifer Lopez and Christina Aguilera. Although his flirtatious explorations of pop culture, fashion and religion haven't pleased everyone, critics slammed his depiction of Kanye West as a black Jesus and he stirred up controversy with his Lolita-like take on a young Britney Spears. That didn't stop this protege of Andy Warhol shying away from a challenge. Hey, y'all, get ready. Let's go. Let's line up. In 2002, LaChapelle swapped photographs for video and financed his own documentary about the dance craze crumping in South Central Los Angeles. This week on Talk Asia, we catch up with David LaChapelle at his latest exhibition in Hong Kong and find out why he ditched the glitz and glamour of fashion photography to return to his artistic route. Now, this is your latest exhibition showing in Hong Kong, and it's the first time that you have uh, shown anything here. It's also the first time that the Raft and also the Bruce Lee collection have been shown globally. What was the motivation behind bringing them to an international audience now? Well, these um, pictures, um, these Bruce Lee images uh, in particular, were made specifically for China. After coming here um, over a year ago into Beijing, I just started reading the Tao and Confucianism and uh, Buddhism and trying to get a, a, a handle on the philosophies that made up the, this like, really rich ancient culture. It's a little bit different to what we know you best for, which is these, you know, crazy, full-on, um, you know, hyper-stylized sex meets celebrity portrait shots. Where has your style come from? Because you look at something of yours and it just screams David LaChapelle. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I never really thought about style, you know. It was always more about what, what I wanted to say. And I was attracted to color. Um, style is something that really just happened. The concept of things were, were what, what interested me most. The story or the narrative behind an image inter interested me more than just how things looked or the form of things. I just never wanted to get stuck within a sort of idea of what my work should look like, because that can be limiting. You're a big fan of um, nudity in your I like pictures. the figure. The figure's important to me. Um, it represents many, many things. At the present time, for me, it's a sort of a, this idea of rescuing the figure from, from meaning one thing in photography. In photography, I feel like we're in this new, new sort of dark ages. In the dark ages, uh, the, the nude body was looked at as something sinful. Mm. Today we look at it as just something to be bought and sold, um, or some sort of uh, product or, or, or some sort of means of sexual gratification. And I wanted to rescue, in my own small way as, as, a, as a photographer, as an artist, to rescue the, the figure so that it, again, will mean something more of, uh, of what it did in the Renaissance, which is the, the idea of spiritual clothing, you know, that this is more than just um, this product to be commodified. And after years of working in fashion and celebrity, it was kind of a paradox, you know, to be having these thoughts and these ideas while working in, in a realm, um, publications, which really sold that notion. You can certainly see that with, um, you know, things like the photos that you've done of Pamela Anderson and Paris Hilton. It was, yeah, these, but, are, these are the people that made up our world. These were these were what America was about for those 18 years that I was photographing. I was, my goal was to r really photograph everything as a, like a tourist, of what America was about and its, its, its choices. And not judgment, not with judgment, but with just questioning of all this consumption and and all of this like uh, celebrity worship. And you can see very clearly in some of the pictures how they really are just, you know, people just worshiping at the, yeah. at the altar of celebrity. You've said that we live in an unshockable world, mm -hmm. yet um, you know, people have frequently been taken aback by the images that you depict. What have you made of the public reaction to your work? I'm, I'm shocked <laughs> <laughs> that, that people are shocked. Honestly, I, I've never, ever set up to take a picture that shocked anyone. I definitely give them the unexpected, 
I wanted to stop people in the magazine. That was my, my goal, just to get them to stop for a minute while they're flipping through and hopefully tear it out. But if not, just look at it long enough to, to take it in. There is this, um, this sort of coming together of sexuality and religion that's really your trademark, I think, these days. And, you know, perfect case in point was when you did Pieta with Courtney Love, and she's cradling uh, you know, this guy who's a combination of Christ and Kurt Cobain. Tell me about doing that shoot. It must have been really emotional for her for a start. Yeah, it, it was. I mean, it was emotional for all of us. And the Pieta for me is a symbol of ultimate loss. There's nothing that symbolizes loss or grief more than a mother losing a child. And so we dyed my friend's hair blonde, who was to be held by, by Courtney. And when he walked out onto the set, I'll never forget it. It's actually on the website. You can watch the filming of it because Courtney thought we were shooting the nativity. She had the Pieta the nativity mixed up in her head. You know, she's a very smart girl. I mean, but she just got it mixed up. She thought we were shooting One's nativity. One's Christ's birth and the other's his death. I know, exactly, but I mean, it just... <laughs> just a it's thought. Only, if you go to my website, you can see the whole conversation. There's the filming, someone was filming the, the, uh, the, they filmed the whole shoot. But anyway, she thought she was holding a baby and she's holding this grown man. Who looks like who, her with dead blonde. Husband. And when he came out, yeah. I am fine. Like, I, I am I fine. I'm just getting, you know, mixed messages from people and told different things. And then, you know. And I said, Courtney, you don't have to do this. If you feel, I mean, we all felt it as soon as he walked out. And I saw the resemblance because we just bleached Walker's hair blonde and glued this, you know, beard onto him, this blonde beard. And I, I said, you don't have to do this. You know, we, we can stop it. I said, no, it's okay. So that was, that's the story behind that picture. And she went ahead and did it. And it was, it was, was emotional doing that photograph. Um, and I admire her for doing it, but it wasn't done with any sense of, of um, exploitation or sort of um, trying to make some sort of spectacle of it. It was really done with the purest intentions. Up, David LaChapelle talks about the pop art pioneer who would jumpstart his career. I purposely pushed the colors in these extra hard and kind of left a little grain because I wanted them to resemble the movie posters of the 1970s. Sure. These are all studies that, that I made, um, basically sketches or just playing around with photographs and cutting them up and really just never really meant for show, but the gallery wanted to exhibit it because it is part of, I guess, the process, if you will. I spent 12 years working in dark rooms, and now it's working with collages and sketches and, and doing these little things. So part of, of these little collages wind up um, being utilized um, in the final pieces. This is chapter two. The first was the deluge, and then they wind up on the shores of paradise or, or, or enlightenment. And we shot those in Hawaii, and um, I'm beginning those now. This isn't really just about a tsunami or a particular storm or, or a disaster. It's not apocalyptic in that sense. For me, it's about the struggles that we all go through in our lives. Religion obviously plays a big part in your work. To what extent, though, does it in your life? I know that you were brought up in a strict Catholic household. Well, it wasn't really strict. Your dad was strict. <laughs> my dad, my dad. You know, I was the third kid to come along, so I think it, I got away with murder compared to my brother and sister. It was, it was a very open, really loving um, childhood, and having grown up with, you know, my mom, who was, had an incredible sense of humor and incredible naturalness. We would, you know, swim together naked as a family, even though you know, my father was super, you know, very Catholic. 
Um, his brother was a priest. There was a sense of humor about things, and I just took that for granted in the sense. You know, religion's become such a sort of an off word, you know, it's sort of a very off-putting word, um, especially in the world of, uh, of art. Although I, I study all the different religions, and right now I'm really into Taoism, and um, I believe that the main religions of the world are, are rivers that lead to the same ocean. From what you described of your childhood, just that little snapshot before, it sounds idyllic, yet you managed to take yourself off to New York at what, 15? Yeah. Yeah, it was, Why? It, well, it, my, at home it was, it was great, but um, I was different, you know, from, from the other kids, and it's sort of the age-old story, you know, we've heard it a million times about being bullied at school, and it was either, you know, kill myself or move to New York, really, and <laughs> that was it. I had found my home, um, New York City, um, yeah, started going to Studio 54 when I was 14, and then to the downtown clubs. And at 15, I, I just left school altogether. Um, was Studio 54 as crazy as they make out? It was magical. I mean, it really, I wasn't into the, you know, I was very young. I didn't do drugs or drink. I was dance, and the music was incredible. And the lights, and everyone looked so beautiful. It was never crowded. You know, it was never like the clubs today, where we yeah. were all smashed up together. Everyone had room to dance, and, you know, it was just the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. Obviously, Andy Warhol saw something in you that he decided to nurture. He gave you your first job at Interview Magazine. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about how instrumental he was in really in getting you where you are today and, and what he meant to you. At 18, although I didn't have a diploma, I had a portfolio of photographs. And I had been going to Andy, showing him the pictures. And because finally I had something to talk to him. I said, hey, I have some photographs. Can I come by and show you? And Andrew, Andy would always be like, oh, they're great. They're great. And I was like, Andy said my pictures were great. <laughs> I'd be really excited. I didn't know. He, 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 he liked my photo, or he said he did. And when I had my second show in New York, they came, um, the staff of interview, and they asked me if I would work for the magazine. And that led to working from 84 to 87. Uh, and then doing the last portrait of Andy before he died. Um, I t put two Bibles beside his head and framed it in um, this very formalistic kind of way. Because I, oh, I was one of the few people who knew that he went to church every Sunday um, when he was in New York. I didn't know that would turn out to be the last portrait. And yet, and that working for him opened up the world of magazines to me. And I couldn't, I couldn't make a living off of the galleries. Um, I put my heart and soul into those pictures, but they weren't selling. Um, and I had to survive, and that became a really great opportunity. You know, you mentioned that you had to do certain things to survive as you're working your way up to be a photographer. I understand that you also had to work for a time as an escort, which, you know, to me sounds like a terribly sad thing to have to resort to. You know, I was, I was 18 years old. I was pretty street smart, having been on, on my own since I was 15. I was 17, 18 years old, and the movie American Gigolo had just come out with Richard Gere, and it seemed kind of glamorous, but, and I couldn't really hold down a, a job. I really, photography was, was really, really expensive. And yeah, there was a time where it was, um, I guess you could look at it as sad. I, 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 I know that the world's different today, and I certainly wouldn't want to give the impression that it was something cool to do or that I would recommend it, because I don't. And the world is such a different place. Now everything's done over the internet, and God knows, you know, it's much more dangerous. You don't know really who you can meet. But there was this bar you, you, that you could go to in New York City and talk to gentlemen, and I always had a good sense, and I would talk to them, and, and thank God I was never really wrong about what I was getting into. Um, and there was a certain respect them I and I got a dinner out of it and sort of have a conversation but I would talk to these people and see them face to face before going anywhere with them and um, it was a really you know easy way to make $150 it seemed at the time you know though I did it for a short time um, um, it's not something you know I'm proud of or, or and really not something I would recommend for anyone to do today. It was a different world.
working with it was always very tense and not pleasant. Some people are very easy and fun, and but on the other extreme, I'd have to say she's one of the hardest people to work with. This is our ghetto ballet. This is how we express ourselves. This is the only way we see fit of storytelling. This is the only way of making ourselves feel like we belong. Let's talk about Rise, because that was your first full-length movie. And I think when people knew that you were going to do a movie, they would just have assumed that you would call your fantastic celebrity Rolodex into play. But you didn't. You went down to South Central LA to document life down there, particularly in light of a, a dance craze that was happening at the time. How come you decide to do that? Well, it, w it was an art movement. I looked at it more like, you know, that art will come out of even the most um, oppressive situations, that true art will still find a way to, to grow between the cracks in, in a sidewalk. And, and these are schools, you know, the school district in Los Angeles is, is one of the poorest in the, in, in the nation, in America. And they don't have art classes. They don't have, they don't have African history. They don't have dance. And these kids had developed this art form. They really had, had this cultural imprint of, of this movement that they were expressing themselves. Their anger was, was getting, you know, instead of joining a gang, the, the choices they were making were heroic. And I looked at them like I'd look at any other star. And I, I treated them as such. And they weren't suspicious of you? No, no, they weren't. They didn't know who I was or anything. Or that, uh, you know, I had a name in photography or anything like that. And it wasn't until a few months of filming that they, like, hey, yo, Dave, I saw you on the red carpet at the MTV <laughs> Awards with Pamela Anderson. What are you doing? And why are you here? And that even gave them, once they found out, they were, like, even happier that, 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 that someone who was working in, the, in that world of, 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 you know, popular culture had, had, was interested in them. Aside from your still portraits, you then moved into um, commercials and also music videos. Mm -hmm. And there's one story that, that I, I love and I hope you'll relate to us. Um, in 2005, you were down to do Hung Up by Madonna. But you haven't spoken since. What happened? I, I always wanted to do a Madonna video. Um, Madonna had a history of great videos and working with great directors. And I liked doing music videos a lot. Um, and it was the first single off the album, which was you know, a prestigious thing to do. When I met with her, it was so, I felt, well, she's really changed, and you know, it was, wasn't going to be this tension that there had been on the still shoots, because working with her was, very, was always very tense. Very tense and um, not, not pleasant Why? at all. Why? What's she like? I don't know. It's very tense. I, I, some people are very easy and fun, and, and you have fun with them, and, but uh, on the other extreme, I'd have to say she's one of the hardest people to work with in terms of just making everyone very on edge and, and uneasy, and it was really an unpleasant experience doing stills with her. So when we were slated to do the video, I met with her, and she was very funny and charming, and, and I thought, wow, you know, she's really changed. And then I was hired to do the, the video, and as, as soon as that happened, she was on the phone. The server just was yelling at me, and everything I said was, she would yell something at me, and. I didn't, you know, understand why she was yelling at me. It was just this conversation was just going on and on, and I'd never really said no to a job. I, I definitely was a workaholic, I have to say. So I was kind of in this like workaholic state where I was 11 months straight. You know, I financed the film Rise myself, it cost almost a million dollars. So we're, we're, I was having this phone call with her, and she was screaming at me, and and I finally just got really quiet and I didn't say anything. And she was just talking, talking, and. She said, David, David, are you there? Said, Sorry. <laughs> Faux English accent. Well, I'm sending an English accent. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm still here. And she said, hold on. And I looked down and my hand was shaking. And I hung up the phone and I just said, I thought to myself, you know, I just did this film in South Central Los Angeles when it was dangerous you know, marginalized, impoverished neighborhoods in the United States, and I never, never was shaking. And I'm shaking, this woman's making me shake as I'm talking to her. And my music video agent was sitting next to me, and she was just like, she let me call the clock in, you know, and... Yeah. Are you just hung up on me? And I was like, yeah, I did, you know, and... 
And from that moment on, and it was a real turning point, I have to really thank Madonna for this. I don't, this isn't a negative thing or some, something that I'm hashing, rehashing, but since you asked, it really was a turning point. Um, because once I said no, it really was the first time I said no to a to You a, hung to, up on hung up. I hung up on him, I hung up. <laughs> and, and, and then it was easy to say no, and that really led, just a, f a few short months later, I was, I was in Maui with my phone turned off. When I was a kid, growing up in New York in the East Village, first starting photography, I think my, I had just this dream, I guess my big goal, or, and I used to pray to have, have a, house, a cabin in the woods, you know, being able to afford really good you know, vegetarian food, or having a garden, and being able to, to, to live off of the money I made as an artist. And that was really the three things I wanted in life, more than anything. When you did get back to photography after your retreat in, uh, in Hawaii, you came back with things like The Rape of Africa. How much work goes into sort of these opulent pieces that you do? A, a lot of work um, goes into them because I have a lot more time now to think, and I can spend a lot more time making these pictures say what I want them to say, and, and using the vocabulary I learned working for magazines and music videos and all, all the rest, and employ those ideas of, or techniques of communicating. So you live this quiet life now um, in Maui, and you don't really so much do the whole, you know, celebrity shenanigans thing anymore, but do you feel like a different David LaChapelle now than you were back then? I kind of feel more back to where I was when I was starting out, except with a, with a lot more life experience. But the, I think more of it's coming, coming home to myself in a sense. I think that, you know, that art can change things. I think that through art we can gain enlightenment, through art we can learn about ourselves and our culture and the time we live in. And that's always been the role of contemporary art. And so I think that, that I aspire to those, those ideals. David, thank you so much indeed for spending time with us today. It's been You're great. welcome. Yeah, no, thank you for your insightful and well-researched um, <laughs> questions. <laughs>